Edinburgh Napier University. My colleagues, Kevin Chalmers and Matt Pedersen, um, have also contributed to this work. A bit about Edinburgh Napier University to start off with, because it's not one you might have heard of. We're one of four universities in the greater Edinburgh area, and we have the Merkiston Castle. Merkiston Castle was built in the 14th century and is the home of the Lords of Merkiston. Now, it transpired that the 8th Lord of Merkiston, born in 1550, who lived until 1617, was a little bit unusual. Uh, the family name for the Lords of Merkiston is Napier. And it was John Napier, the 8th Lord of Merkiston, who in 1614, three years before he died, wrote the book on logarithms, decimal point, and spherical trigonometry. So that's where we're at. Scroll forward quite a few years to 1958, and the City of Edinburgh Council wanting to build a college, and by one vote decided not to knock this castle down. So we have it mainly as a boardroom. Anyway, because, of course, it was built as a co college of technology, it has buildings around it which make it not quite so presentable. Six, 1960s technical colleges. Anyway, let's, let's start to think about the, the challenge at hand. Most software developers have probably never programmed a parallel solution. They probably think parallel programming is hard. They probably or possibly not taught it during their education. They've never understood basic thread models if they were taught them. And depending on your background, may think you need formal methods to develop parallel solutions. But they realize that they need to program in parallel to exploit modern multi-core and cluster technology, to improve solution performance, have additional skills in the marketplace, but how to start? Thereby hangs the problem. So, having taught parallel programming or since the mid-1980s in various guises, um, and more recently in a JVM-based environment, um, and as a, as a result of ha having written some books for student texts where the reviewers said, wouldn't it be nice if you could make it easier? I embarked upon groovy parallel patterns. Basically, the goal was that the implementer only had to implement sequential code that is application-specific. They don't have to do any of the parallel stuff. They then used the library to create the parallel application. But they have to work out how to break down the solution to exploit the parallelism. And actually, that's the hard bit. But let's not worry about that. With enough examples, you can get away with it. So what are the foundations? The fundamental foundation is Hawes Communicating Sequential Processes, uh, a paper published in 1978 on which there has been continuous and continuing work ever since at the University of Oxford and other educational establishments around the world and provides a theoretical basis for the style of parallel processing used, which means as engineers we can actually build upon that without having to force the algebra down the programmer's throat, because that's the last thing they want to do. Resulting from a, a community that's been going since the mid-1980s in the UK, uh, a version of CSP was implemented for Java. Uh, originally from the University of Kent and now more generally available, for example, as part of the GPARS. However, my view of parallel processing and GPAR's view of parallel processing is somewhat different. When I started to teach this, the students complained that um, they had to write a lot of stuff. And it was around this time that Groovy came out. And so, together with some colleagues, we sat down and we wrote a few very simple, very uncomplicated helper classes that basically mean that you can actually build a parallel system with just the code that you want and not everything else that you need when you get Java. 
So it was essentially easier to create JCSP-based systems using these groovy helper classes. And that's the basis of the two books that I have written. So the user codes the sequential part. They use the library to create the parallel solution. And the, all the solutions terminate and recover resources. Quite crucial, provided the sequential code is correct. Get your sequential code correct, and you get whatever you get uh, in, if it's incorrect. The user can incorporate error messages, which can be passed back. It's aimed at multi-core and cluster architectures, at not at GPGPU. That's a completely different style of processing, not instantly friendly to the style of parallelism that we're using. The style of parallelism we're using is a process as it writes to another process. There is no shared data. Communications are synchronized and unbuffered. And that is the total theoretical knowledge that you need to start off with. There's a bit more, but not much. So, simple example, Monte Carlo Pi. Unit positive quadrant, if we have a quadrant of radius 1 with the po and we calculate random points at x and y such that x and y are less than 1, less than or equal to 1, then if x squared plus y squared is e less than or equal to 1, then the point is within the quadrant. And the ratio of those points within the quadrant is approximately pi by 4. Have enough points and you'll get a more accurate pi. So, we can generate large numbers of points. We can exploit parallelism by using all the cores on a multi-core processor so that we generate even more points in the same time as a single core, which, of course, is one of the goals of parallelism. You either have a larger problem or you get a more accurate solution. OK, so let's run a Pi farm. I'm going to have four workers. I'm going to generate 1,024 object instances. And each of those object instances is going to generate 10,000 iterations. To define the farm, I call a pattern called data parallel collect. I pass it some information about how I'm going to emit data into the system and how I'm going to collect the results. I tell it how many workers I want to do. And I tell it that I want it to carry out the within op of the, uh, the data that I'm going to send it, uh, such that uh, it knows what to do within the farm. So to run it, you do that. That's it. That's your first parallel program. Don't know much about how it works, but let's not worry about that. OK. So I have a standard uh, class that everything has to extend. I have some local variables. I have some statics that allow me to generate the instances. And I have some strings which give me the names of the methods that I have defined within my object. That is crucial for providing flexibility in due course. The init class basically says that the initers instances is set equal to P0, and I pass that as a list parameter. I've chosen to send everything as list parameters simply because uh, it's easier for uh, programmers to use those. A create instance basically says, provided I haven't created all the instances, uh, then set the iterations from there, set within to zero, increment the instances, and return normal continuation. When I have created all the instances, the 1,024, I send a normal termination. That sends the emit process that's going to be created to terminate, and in due course, the termination signals get sent through the system. The get within method, very simple. It's got to have a parameter even if you don't use it. I generate a new random number operator. I give myself a couple of variables. I get the next floats. I calculate the formula, work out whether it's within, and always return completed OK. So I'm always going to expect a return. If I don't return completed OK and return something else, that's going to mean something to the programmer who built the system. OK, so that's how we ran it. Let's now look at the details. So what's the name of the class that I'm going to use in order to be able to emit the data, the objects? What's the name of the init method? 
What is the initialization data I require? It's the number of instances. What is the create method associated with creating an object instance? And what data do I require that, in order to create that instance? Okay. The results data details are fairly similar. What's the name of the results class? What's the init method for the class? How do I collect the data that gets sent to me? And finally, what do I do to close it all down? Possibly print out the answer. So, yet again, you'll see that we've got some statics here, which are the strings that I'm going to be using later, that I've used earlier on. Internally, these are the actual names of the methods. So, in other words, you can have a, 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 set, a certain amount of indirectness built into the system in terms of the way that you name things. In it, in it class, in the results case, does nothing apart from return. The collector basically inc increments the iteration sum with the number of iterations that that object has got. And we've passed it an object from the collect process. Within is added to the within sum, and we return the fact that we've completed that. So each object is going to come with iterations and within, and we're going to add those. Finalize does what you'd expect it to do. It works out what the total thing is. It prints out a pretty message and then returns. So if we've got four workers, we're going to emit objects. We then have a process which is called a spreader, which is one fan any. What it means is any input that comes in can be sent to any of these output channels. These then go to a worker process that the, the programmer has not had to write. Then the output from the worker process goes to a reducer, which takes any of these inputs at, as they become ready and outputs them to a single channel, the collector. Okay, so we've basically generated with that one uh, process definition of data parallel collect, an emit process, a spreader, four workers, etc. And I refer to this as a, with, the, with this notation, we emit this object, we, sp we spread it, there's no change it by the spreaders into a different object. We then are going to do the within op with four workers. We can therefore deduce what the size of the any channels is, are, and we can then send it to the collector and we can annotate that with the results data object. So, the proof is in the pudding, doing it. So I've got a lab full of these sorts of processors. They're reasonably powerful. Uh, they have got four actual cores and eight logical threads uh, and vast amounts of memory. Later on, the one gigabyte of interconnect is going to be crucial. So what's the performance like? Well, when I do it sequentially, because all the... Uh, because essentially the code is sequential from the point of view of the application, uh, we can find out what the sequential code runtime is. And it's not surprising that when you run it with one worker, it actually gets slower because you've built the parallel infrastructure in order to do it. With two workers, it doesn't quite half, but it's not bad, right? But with four workers, uh, it goes nowhere near. And that, of course, is because those are four logical threads, not two actual threads. So if you want to make effective use of a multi-core processor, try not to have more processors than there are actual cores for most applications. All right? And when we go to eight workers, it actually gets worse. Not by much, two milliseconds which is, doesn't sound very much, but this is a trivial example. And um, we see that pattern consistently and regularly, except in some perverse examples which we shall come on to. Okay, let's look at the details objects. These are used by processors within the library to capture data object characteristics. There are many common elements, and they're specialized depending on the process to which that object is going to be received. The data details is used to create and emit data objects, result details to collect results. 
Local details to describe pro objects that are used by a worker process in order to be able to carry out its function. So every so often you may need a local uh, class within a worker, therefore you need to define it. We've also got a mechanism whereby we can build feedback systems, so you will need to have objects that enable you to pass feedback information back. Those could either just be Booleans or they could be objects with other data in them. So, string name, the name of the data class, init method, the name of the init method, the init data is a list, the create method is a string, and the create data is a list are all examples of the sorts of things that the programmer is going to have to specify in the details. And the method name is stored as a string property in the details object, in other words, d init method. The object containing the method will be read into a process. I don't know what object is coming in in any of these processes. I only know what's being emitted, and I only know what the, some, of the obje, uh, some of the processes need to use, like the results are used by the collector at the end, and so on. So, I read in the object, and the, the, the method is then invoked by o.ampersand, uh, quote, dollar, and that returns the character string which is associated with the name of the method. So we've used method pointers for this thing. So where d, data, d init data is a list property of the details object and we can just pass the data as a parameter in the normal manner. When I discovered that mechanism, I was overjoyed. But I did have to refactor everything. Okay, so there's, there's what we were doing. So what does the worker do? Well, it's got a, a channel input and a channel output. These are the channel implementations of CSP directly implemented by the JCSP and with these nicer mechanisms for dis defining them. We are expecting a string called function and a list that may be defaults, if not specified, to null. While running, we input an object. If it's an instance of universal terminator, then running becomes false, and this process will now terminate. Otherwise, we carry out the function with the data modifier, get a return code. If the return code isn't completed, OK, we write out the object that has been modified. So we write O to the output channel, and then otherwise we call a method that's available throughout the system, and it causes the thing to stop. Patterns. Basically, patterns allow a user to invoke a parallel architecture without any underlying knowledge of the internal architecture. Great if you know, if you've been given a pattern that works. Data parallel is a farm architecture where multiple data objects undergo the same process at the same time. Task parallel, typically called pipelines, where the data object passes through a number of processes, each undertaking a different operation or task, and the parallelism is achieved by allowing, the, as soon as the first task has been completed, the next bit of data can be done with the first while it's doing the second, and so on. So it pipelines through. Those are the classic high-level pattern architectures. There are others, but those are the two main ones. Skeletons are the level below. They are components that are easier to combine into specific architectures once the programmer is more confident in their parallel processing capability. In other words, get, get confidence in the fact that you can make things run faster or bigger and then see if you can do even better. So, we have a group of parallel worker processes all undertaking the same operation, like we had in the data parallel collect. We have a basic pipeline of parallel worker processes, and we have, or will have shortly, matrix, a parallel array of worker processes undertaking matrix operations, and we've got a kernel mechanism for a parallel uh, array of workers for image processing, which work. Connectors allow co components that allow joining of skeletons. One fan any, any fan one were examples. Spreaders transfer data from one process to many others. We have different models of spreading. And similarly, the opposite, reducing. In order to be able to use clusters, 
we need quite specific cluster connectors to enable communication between workstations or uh, pro servers in a cluster. So, those are the three main types of connector. Let's have another example. Concordance. This is a, an example beloved of functional programmers because they think all you have to do is keep calling the function and it'll work. Um, my experience is of several presentations where I have attended these things. Uh, the people that do it in a more traditional way, uh, an imperative way, tend to get reasonable results. I have yet to see a presentation where somebody actually got a functional version working on a large enough text. Yes, on a small novel, but not something decent. So, a concordance is a means of determining the places where the same string of words is repeated in a text. It's usually the concordance is constructed for sequences of words from 1 up to some val defined value n. Typically and often used by um, people to find out whether the same sorts of phrases occur in different works to find out whether Shakespeare or Marlowe wrote, Marlow wrote a play or something like that. Usually used for large texts and fundamentally the output comprises the string of words and where they were found in the text. So, the first phase is read a file line by line and extract the words removing extraneous punctuation. I'm not interested in uh, the odd hyphen because it came at the end of a line. We can concatenate the word. Uh, I am interested in apostrophes because uh, God with an S is different from God apostrophe S because one is the possessive and one is just plural gods. Calculate an integer value based upon the letters that make up the word including the hyphens and apostrophes if the hyphens are, are, are non are, are, are important. It's easy to compare using integers. We just use the ASCII coding for the letter values and save the values in a list called word list. That also provides the required data for n equals 1. Now what I've got to do is for each value of n will I have its own data structure. For strings of length 2 to n we sum sequence of values depending on the length. So for 2 you add 0 and 1, then 1 and 2, then 2 and 3, and you do that. For as big an n as you want. Save these values in a list called sequence list. The phase 3 is for each of the sequence lists 1 to n, we find the index of each element that has the same value. So we've got a string of integers, we just go through and find out where all the equal values are. Store this in a map called equal key map comprising the key, which is the value, and the entry is the list of index values where that value was found. You can see that I'm breaking the problem down into nice, easy steps, because I know how to parallel, in pro pr parallel program. So, for each of the n equal key maps, process each entry in turn. This is where we have a problem, because the same key value may result from different word strings. So, we build a map comprising the strings of words, that are associated with a particular key value. So if we have more than one key st uh, string of words, we'll have more than one entry in the map and an index of the places where that string was found. And then that map is the concordance for that value of n, so we just have to print it out. So each data structure is indexed by n. Each data structure is only written to by one of the phases. The original word list is referred to in phase 4, but is only read, so that's not a problem. Hence, we can do the processing in parallel for each value of n. That's a technique that's going to have to be learned. It applies many, many times, but it's one of those things that has to be acquired. Okay, sequential versus parallel. The sequential solution just iterates through each value of n for each phase, which enables you to test your algorithm. The parallel version still goes through the phases, except uh, each phase uses a worker for each value of n. We are going to create two parallel versions, a pipeline of groups and a group of pipelines. I've created a pattern called task parallel of group collects. 
I've got an emit, I've got a collect, I've got three stages, and in the, each of the stages I'm going to do the value list, the indices map, and then the words map that I've previously described, and I'm going to have four workers. So I've got three stages and four workers. I'm going to break, create 12 processes, effectively, and then I run it. Right, the other way, of course, is this way. And basically what happens is we have, I haven't created a pattern for this, we have an emit process, a one fan any, and a pipeline of group collects. So the pipeline of group collects is a skeleton. And basically what it looks like is an any group list, then for each of the stages minus one, a list group list. And what a list is, is just an array of ch channels for as many workers as we've got, which was four. So, we initially we have the emit going to an any, because we've got a one fan any here, we've got an any group list here, then we have as many list group lists as we want, and then we have a list group collect, and that, of course, constructs a pipeline. It's a data flow. In group out, we can have any list as the inputs descriptor and any and list on this side and we carry out the function for the number of workers. They have advantages and disadvantages depending on uh, the, the application and sometimes the only way to find out is to run it and find out what happens. So by creating a, a, a group of pipelines what we've done is we've got emit one fan any, a value list pro uh, ob worker an indices map worker, a words map worker, and a collect worker for the number of workers. So I had four workers. So that pipeline will get repeated four times. Whereas what the pipeline of groups generates is emit a one fan any, a value list with that many workers feeding into an indices map feeding for that many workers, and so on. These are lists, so the first worker or the zeroth worker in this will write to the zeroth worker in here, will write to the, and so on. I could have had any's and other such sundry things, but we get some interesting results. Because that is the time that it takes to do it sequentially. Right? So with just one core and the parallel architecture, I've managed to improve it even over the... Um, sequential version. There is a very simple reason. If you have a large text, the majority of the application is doing I.O. Right? And so uh, we, we, we can start to do, with, even with just one core, we can do things better. With two cores, um, it doesn't quite do as well as the other one. It's nowhere near twice as fast because it's doing a whole load of uh, I.O., and it's the I.O. that's causing the problem. With four workers, remember, um, that's, it starts to go worse. But interestingly, for eight threads on our multi-core uh, multi machine, the pipeline of groups does significantly better than the group of pipelines. And I think it's down to the fact that we have so many more uh, opportunities for things to move around. But more importantly, we can make better use of the multiple file handlers that we've got active in the system, depending on the value of n. And the value of n that I chose was 6, because I happen to know that in the Bible, there is God saw that it was good. It appears in Genesis five times. So I, got, I, I knew I could test it. Okay, and that's what this performance is on. Okay, another example, much more challenging. Primes and the Goldbach conjecture. We're going to initiate, initially evaluate the primes up to n. We're going to evaluate the Goldbach conjecture using the primes previously calculated. Don't worry if you don't know what it is. It's one of the old, according to Wikipedia, it's one of the oldest and best known unsolved problems in number theory. It states that every even integer greater than two can be expressed as the sum of two primes. Interesting challenge. Okay, let n be the integer up to which we test. 
we require the primes up to max p root n of plus 1. We use a sieve to find the primes up to max p. Partition the range up to n to find all the primes in that range in parallel. So I'm going from uh, whatever max p is uh, plus 1 uh, up to n, split it up over a number of workers, and I can find all the primes simply by doing addition in each of the partitions. Then we got to create a single list of primes which is broadcast in parallel to all the Goldbach workers. Each worker is going to be allocated an overlapping range of primes. It has to overlap because, unfortunately, when you start working out uh, how even numbers are generated, sometimes you need a bigger range of primes than you would initially think by looking at the double the first one. Some of them you need to be able to go back down a bit. You can work out how many you need, but that takes a bit of effort. Each worker then finds all the sequential even numbers it can calculate from its range of primes. We then collect the results from each worker and ensure the ranges overlap, except for the last, because obviously if we're going to, up to uh, values up to n, uh, the maximum Goldbach number is going to be something less than 2n, as I've just said. Okay, this is the architecture I built. We emit it with a local. We have a, a local worker class that effectively provides the sieve. We output the primes. We cast that to that prime on a seek cast list. What that says is, I'm going to send these primes to all the list elements, but I'm going to write them sequentially. Then I'm going to sieve the prime over the number of workers that I've got. Then I've got the primes in each partition coming out. I then have a list of values coming out. I take those in sequence, combine them from any back at down into one to get back the single list of primes. I then cast that list that's coming out here in parallel to all the Goldbach calculators, and I have as many G Goldbach workers as possible. I then incorporate those results back and then collect the final results. So this is quite a complicated architecture. Yeah. But you can see what's going to go on. The interesting thing is, for anything greater than one, it goes slower on the primes. The sieve is a effect, really efficient way of doing it. Very, very efficient. It's hard to parallelize. So the performance. OK. N, where's it gone? N equals 1,000. It flatlines. It doesn't matter how many workers you have. For n equals 20,000, I've doubled the size. It's hardly had any effect. For n equals 40,000, it's starting to get worse. For n equals 80,000, um, I'm seeing some performance more or less along the lines I would have expected. And then for n equals 160,000, um, it starts to go quite slowly. Uh, this is obviously an application um, which requires a cluster. But I'm not going to do that with this example. Another classic example from parallelization is Mandelbrot. Uh, basically, you've got numbers, complex numbers, x plus i, y, such that you iterate from z equals naught up, such that if it's bounded, then uh, you can determine whether or not the uh, point is in the Mandelbrot set and traditionally we produce a picture. So the Mandelbrot algorithm, I've got x naught and y naught, those come down here, it's essentially the scaled x coordinate of the pixel and the y coordinate, I've got x and y naught, how many iterations am I going to do, uh, that is changeable, x squared plus y squared is less than 2 squared, why I didn't write 4 I've got no idea and provided the iteration is less than the max iteration. We have a little calculation. And finally, when we fall out of this loop, it's either because that was less than 4 or the iteration was not less than the max iteration, in which case we color them white or black depending. And I stole that from the associated web space uh, just because there's no point trying to work it out. You might as well use somebody else's code. Okay, 
We can process per pixel so that if we have 350 by 200, I can generate 70,000 processes. Gee, fantastic. Or I can process it per line. I'll do about 200 processes. So if we consider the space that's required, typically it's from minus 2.5 to 1 in the x and minus 1 to 1 in the y. That yields 70,000 processes or 200 processes. And processing time is determined by the maximum number of iterations that you permit. OK. In, a, in, a, in addition, the library contains a simple process-based canvas environment, standard Java AWT, to display such Im in images. It is itself a parallel of a manager and an interface processes. The user is not concerned with this detail. Of course, visualization influences performance. So I've done two versions, one with and one without. And the versions are identical apart from the collect process. So the architecture we've got is emit, one fan any. For that many number of workers, calculate the color. So I can be doing either lots of pixels in parallel or lots of lines in parallel collate the results, and either send them to the user interface version or just one that prints out the answer. So, on the basis that pretty pictures will wake you up, oh, it does help if I say run Mandelbrot. Idiot carriage. Slowly, all will be revealed. When running that, I had intended to put my microphone next to the fan because the fan is now running full tilt because I was using the, all the processing. You may say, OK, so that wasn't very fast. Uh, it was about 12 seconds. Uh, it's a 700 by 400 array, so there's that many... Uh, it, but that's the line version, as you could see, it was building it up. But each of those black dots has been, and white dots has been generated uh, independently using a display list and so on and so forth. But the programmer doesn't need to be aware of that, they just need, how to know, need to know how to do it. Okay. So... The Mandelbrot performance, OK. The pixel takes nearly twice as long as the line version, which isn't surprising. Yeah, you've got 70,000 processes that you're going to share. Uh, I've got four workers, uh, one worker, two workers, three workers, four workers. It doesn't scale very well. That's not unusual. A lot of these things don't. However, if we look at it in terms of the size of the um, image size, so I've started off with the 700 by 400, and it took just over, uh, just over a second without the visualization. Double it, and the actual is 2.85 seconds, where, whereas the... I don't know what I've done there. Anyway, we'll ignore that. Uh, then 2,800 by 1,600, and then finally uh, 56,000 by 320,000. That is a very big image. It won't even fit on an HD screen. So we've got, we can see that the performance is going up. Right. OK, let's make it into a cluster system. I've got exactly the same architecture. I've got an emit, a collect. I've now got this special process mechanism here, which is I'm going to... Every node has to be able to say, please, can I have some data? Here you are. And what it's going to do, it's got an any, so this bit here is identical to what we had before. And then we're going to du duplicate that over a number of nodes, and each of the nodes is going to run a number of workers using the cores. And then we're going to collect all those results across the network. 
Okay, so effectively what we're generating with three workers, three nodes and eight workers, is a request fan any which says, please can I have something, here you are. That's all taken account of this process and it knows where the request has come from to be able to send it to the right place. Now initially, all eight workers are going to be working quite hard. So there's going to be a lot of initial communication saying, please can I have some data. Once they've started calculating the data, it, it'll sort itself out and the results will get sent. What's getting sent is the number of white and black in each of the, uh, the lines plus the lines. Okay, so I was running 505,600 by 32,000, 3,200 with max iterations set to 1,000, right? If I ran it just on the host node, then it took uh, 238 seconds quite a long time. Then what I did was I ran it with one node, so the host was generating the data and collecting the results, the one host was doing all the work. And as we can see, it had a little one second effect. When we get to two, if you actually take that number and divide it by two, uh, you get the red line. In fact, we got that number there. Similarly, when I went up to three nodes, we got, okay, it's not completely scalar in the terms of the, number, the, the numbers, but we're actually getting really good performance improvement from a cluster. The interesting thing is that the only node that needs to know the code is the host. All of the other nodes just run a single process called run node, which sits there and waits for code to be sent to it. We download all the classes automatically across the network. If we, don't get, if we get to anywhere and we don't have the class that we require in here, it will send a request back, get it, so we've built in a class loader across the network. The code takes milliseconds to load over, initially to load over the system, uh, and so on and so forth. But it's a bit cleverer than that, in that if you have inner classes, and one node doesn't need to know about an inner class, then it doesn't receive the inner class definition. If that no object then gets passed on to another node uh, that does need the inner class, the request will go back and we'll fetch all the data, uh, all the class definitions that we require as we go around the system. You have to go backwards through a chain that's already been created. There has been no change whatsoever to any of the data, uh, to any of the algorithms in order to run this, apart from making sure that the initial data that I was sending out was serializable because that's going across an internet access. Summary. I would argue that it has a relatively short learning curve. You choose the pattern, you imply the required data, implement the required data and result classes, and then invoke the pattern. You can use the skeletons, but at the moment you have to create the channel connections because it's in development. Con cluster computing is built in, it involves more complexity, and the class definitions are circulated automatically the person doesn't have to worry about get, making sure that all the code is around the system. Future directions. The kernel image processing needs more work on it, as does the matrix. I have abused some students to do that. We need more demo applications. I've abused another student. These are on as project students for next year. And we need a DSL based on that uh, notation used in the slides. Um, for reasons of history, I use Eclipse, <coughs> um, fundamentally because it's free to, it's available more easily for students. And I was going down the um, Eclipse route. As a result of attending this conference, I won't. Those are the links to me. Uh, I am not a fan of social networking. But it does mean I know who... If you want to tell me it was a rubbish talk, just send me an email saying it was rubbish. I don't care. All right? Um, the, the repository is available. Uh, 
and there is a, the, all the other libraries that you require are all there together with the documentation and it's all available. As I said, this built upon, if you want to find out how the underlying CSP works, I've got these two books, uh, Understanding Concurrency and Parallelism Effectively. They're free. Uh, you can download them from the, those websites. A much easier way of finding them is to just type Book Boon Kerridge into um, a search engine and they will undoubtedly come up as the first two. So that's a book, book boon, a Danish company uh, that makes text available to students. The disadvantage is there are adverts, but students seem to skip over those these days. And there is an example, all the examples in the, co in the books work. And since September 2014, those two books have been downloaded 320,000 times, which I find staggering. So it's patently obvious that out there, there are people wanting to understand how to build concurrent and parallel systems. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Does it work? Good old. You're going to be eating into drinking time. Yeah. Yep. Could you elaborate on that? Yep, they've gone down the actor's route. And I, I have a fundamental problem with actors, which is I don't know how you can demonstrate that your network is correct. And um, it also relies on cues to a certain extent, well, to a large extent. And therefore, um, oh, I'm not supposed to move. Therefore, um, if you've got a buffer for a queue, what happens when it gets full? Oh yes, I know that you can have 16 gigabyte machines or bigger, but there's still going to be a point when it's going to get full and it will fall over. You don't want that to happen. Whereas, with the CSP-based approach, you can actually reason about the behavior. And if you really want to do it and have to do it, you can model it in CSP, your application, and demonstrate and prove that it goes through the analysis tools which are all automated in a product called FDR and demonstrate that it works. And in addition, the JCSP library has been put through such an analysis, so we know that the JCSP library is correct. Um, my parallel helper classes have not been put through a, li a test like that because they're just hate making life easy. However, I don't know how many students have actually been through, but it's at least 500. And as far as I'm aware, students are the best debuggers ever. Or error finders. A bit like Jacob's person. I think it was Jacob that asked me the question. Uh, I, I, but the trouble is, I've got two bright lights staring at me in the face, and you're in the dark. <laughs> Any more? Grant. What happened? I believe drinks start at seven o'clock. <laughs>